What's up, everybody? Less than 24 hours from when we came to you last. <laughs> another Coast to Coast podcast back at you here on InsideCarolina.com. Emergency edition as we talk about Jalen Withers committing to the Tar Heels. I'm your host, Joey Powell. We're brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt. All right. Thanks for being here. A little emergency edition commitment pod for you. Appreciate everybody tuning in. Cheryl McMillan, Sean Moran are going to talk with me a little bit about Jalen Withers, a 6'8", 215-pound forward from Huntersville via Cleveland, who just committed to North Carolina today uh, after talking with the coaching staff. Uh, he was on Louisville's squad last year, which was a record-breakingly bad team. Um, but we're going to uh, talk a little bit about this. Sean, I want to come to you first. In Jalen Withers, uh, sitting here looking at some of his stuff, when he came out of high school, Evan Daniels said that his calling card was, quote, his long-range shooting. That was uh, around 2018, 2019 that Evan said that. I want to ask you, what is UNC getting at Jalen Withers? So I think that that calling card still rings true um, right now. You got to see that as a as a freshman after he he redshirted. Um, you did not see that his sophomore year when his uh, shooting plummeted, uh, and then this this past year you did see it jump back up. Both from a, a volume perspective, he hit 40, 43s on almost one hundred, uh, so just under forty two percent. But I think you're you're getting a guy who fits a really the most important position I'd say on the, on the court for UNC in terms of we've seen what a great stretch four uh, can do in Brady. And we've seen what, um, you know, trying to put a, another five alongside Armando looked like last year. Um, and, you know, for, for Withers, he is very versatile. So he, he had to play center his freshman year just due to necessity at Louisville, but he's, uh, you know, really more the the four. Um, and, and let's, I'll start with offensively three point shooting. Um, but he can, you know, he can handle the ball a little bit and he's he's versatile defensively. He can switch um a variety of positions, really I'd say three through five, but he can, you know, he has that ability where it's like the four three versus the five four. Um and, and I think that's a pretty big distinction to make. Um, you know, we'll get more into his game, but I think um outside shooting and versatility are the main two traits that he'll be he'll be bringing to to UNC. Is he more of a power forward or a small forward, in your opinion? Uh, definitely power power forward. Um, you know, last year for Louisville, they operated with their four man. Um, you know, on kind of in line with the in line with the point guard at the top of the key, uh, and he can he can put the ball on the floor, but he's definitely not. Uh, I'd say a true true three, but he is somebody that can slot down offensively, defensively when when needed. Cheryl, how did his recruit, his recruitment happen? You know, with this transfer portal stuff, it, everything's kind of microwaved. And uh, any kind of insight you can give about prior relationships with this staff or, you know, we know he's a, a legacy basketball player. Can you tell me a little bit about how this recruitment happened and, and what the window kind of looked like? Yeah, so he entered the portal, I think, uh, a little over not quite three weeks ago. I need to check the exact date. I should have checked the exact date. Um, but from there, he said he heard from about 25 uh, schools. And I think what happened is, um, as you know, he started to hear from the in-state schools, um, especially, I think he realized that being closer to home might be good for him. If you go out and read some of the, the material um, just, just been written about him over the last couple of years, I think kind of confidence in himself sometimes can be an issue. Um, yeah, Kenny Payne said it. I think Chris Mack said it when he first uh, got to Louisville. And I think the idea of, you know, just being in your home state, being around comfortable uh, surroundings and with people you know uh, intrigued him. Uh, he played AU with Armando Baycott uh, back in the day when Baycott was still with Team Loaded before he switched to Team Takeover um, prior to his senior year. So there's a, that connection. And then um, uh, his dad uh, is the same high school class as Sean May, so the class of 2002. And <laughs> yeah, I know we're old. And so they know each other. So I think you add in in that stuff, you add in the fact that it, you know, even if it doesn't feel like it at times to a lot of these kids, it's still North Carolina. To add that in, and it was a um, uh, what he said was a pretty easy decision for him. Uh, I think it eventually came down to a, a couple in-state schools, uh, you know, for his for his services in, in North Carolina one out. Sean, I think the easy look here for uh, inside Carolina subscribers or or just people in general who want to kind of detract from this situation 
they look at you know withers they see a kid who was uh, you know basically a composite four star had kind of a 93 rating coming out of high school but he was not a top 100 kid he also played on a louisville squad this past year that was just (laughs) boo-boo awful what do you say in looking at his game that folks should be excited about as opposed to you know maybe just looking at at stats and, and cherry picking here or there and not really not really wanting to swallow what, what what's out there for him. Sure. I mean, I think at, at this point he's, uh, you know, cause he, he did red shirt. So four, four years removed from that ranking. Um, and I think as we've seen, whether it's one and done players or, or two and done, once you get in, you know, the, the rankings, uh, kind of go up and up in the air. So I wouldn't be too concerned on, on that. I think the main concern is, you know, what bad habits did he establish this past year playing for one of the worst teams ever in ACC. Um, and you can't tell me that there weren't bad habits established being part of that group for for the whole season. So I think that's that's going to be a huge adjustment. But in terms of when you do look at just the the, the quote unquote counting stats, um, you're, you're not you're not going to be thrilled or, or blown away by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I think once again, you can look at the the three point shooting, forty one percent on a hundred shots. So it's not not a huge amount as we as we mentioned earlier, but it is it is something. Um, I think he's pretty uh, proficient in catch and shoot threes, especially from the corner. Uh, but once again, you're 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 getting a guy, and it's kind of weird to say potential for somebody that is twenty one, twenty two, because you do watch his game and you and you can kind of see, man, if he could do this for 40 minutes or he, or 20, you know, 30 minutes, whatever it is. And he, he was, he's on, you could, you could, you know, he was all ACC as a freshman uh, and he averaged 10, 10 plus points a game, shot 38% from three. So you're thinking, man, this guy's going to have himself a nice, nice ACC career. It definitely didn't turn out that way, but I think you can still see that freshman year and even the junior year, the, the positives um, and, and you now put some talent around that and, and put, um, you know, confidence and you can see that blossoming. I think there are things that, you know, from a focus standpoint, um, right now he very high turnover player. So when he, when he drives the basket, he has that ability, but he usually needs kind of two to three moves to get there, which can lead to turnovers or sloppy passes. So he had a really high turnover rate, not overly explosive, uh, off two feet, but if you get him in space, um, you know, he can, I think he only had three dunks this this past year. Um, but I think if if he's focused and and you know he's he's crashing the glass defensively, he's he's guarding, switching, and being aggressive. I think you can see those stats hopefully improve. Um, and that he he plays a instrumental four three. And and the last thing I, I'd say would be kind of knowing your role. You know, he's not going to be a guy that needs twenty shots. And I think you have RJ and. Armando, who will be be doing that. So, how do you fill in guys around around them that that fit and that can you know play defense and and uh, you're not going to sag off into the paint? I think is is one of the most important things. Sherelle, I want you to talk a little bit about how he might fit uh, into North Carolina's culture and into UNC's current locker room as it stands, as few bodies as there may be, and specifically knowing that UNC did not have the year that they wanted last year nor did Jalen Withers have the year that he wanted last year. Does that kind of give both he and the squad some common ground that they can both build around? And just, you know, both of those things, and, and maybe, you know, how do you project him fitting in as 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 a, a person as part of the program, not just a player? Yeah, I still think that's a little TBD. Um, like you said, it's it's kind of speed dating <laughs> with – um, these portal players and, you know, we, he did, UNC didn't recruit him really out of high school. So we haven't got a chance to know him very well. I, I think just, you know, common sense would tell you, like you said, he was on one of the worst teams in ACC history and he kind of wanted, wants to get that um, stench for less, lack of a better word off of him. And, you know, there's a story up now where we talked to him and we asked him like, can you learn anything from last year? And basically he was like, you know, I've seen diversity, like I've seen the bottom of the barrel. I know what awful looks like. And, you know, I don't want that to happen to me again. So I think uh, UNC for, you know, comparison's sake, kind of dealt with something similar where they, you know, obviously it's not the same going four and 28 versus what UNC did, but they kind of were at the bottom of their barrel as well. So I, I think it's a valid point that both 
you know, Withers and the UNT team feel like they have something to prove, feel like that last season wasn't representative of necessarily who they are, or what they are. Um, so I, I, I think that's a, a, a definite add. And then on the basketball side, I mean, you know, I, I know folks will, will say, you know, here's a guy from a four and 28 team. And uh, of course, you know, he's going to put up numbers, but you start to look at what North Carolina has said it wants to do. And by the way, so this is the fifth portal commitment for Hebrew Davis since he got to UNC. All five have been that hybrid forward, you know, kind of uh, stretch four position. So obviously very important to him. Um, but, you know, his numbers in the ACC last year, you can caveat however you want to caveat it, but he was 31 of 70 in ACC play from three, which is fourth in the conference. That's 44%. That's an ACC play. Now you can say, yeah, they were wide open because he was down 20, or yeah, they were wide open because the team is awful and the other team didn't care, but you still got to make them. If you shoot them, you got to make them. And he did that. And so you start projecting with UNC, you know, RJ Davis coming off the pick and roll. There are many times over the last couple of years where there were players in the corner or players on the wing who were wide open and couldn't, you know, hit the shot. So I think offensively, the question is, does he make UNC better? Is he able to uh, make wide open jump shots? And I think his profile says yes. Now, obviously, things change when you get to Carolina for whatever reason. We'll, we'll see what happens. But from what his numbers say, the counting stats and some of the advanced stats, he should be able to hit an open jump shot, which would be an improvement from last year when UNC struggled with that. I think defensively, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly how he matches up or, or what he does well defensively, but maybe that's a situation where you're not really looking for that. You're looking for, okay, how can UNC get better um, offensively? And it's like, oh, there's a shooter over there. Let's go get the shooter. It could be as simple as that. I think we'll find out more as time goes on, but uh, if you look at the first two signings from the portal for UNC, you definitely see a trend of wanting guys who can provide space for Baycott and Davis. So that I think if you're starting, again, don't judge the plan for a couple months, but if you're starting to think about judging the plan, I do think that um, while they the players they've gotten may be slightly you know, uh, more deficient in certain areas, they've increased the shooting profile already of UNC from what it was last year, which is one of the objectives I think the coaching staff had going into portal season. I think you've done a great job, uh, you and Sean both, over the course of, of, of the last month or so talking about you know, UNC's plan and how, you know, how things fit with each other. I think there's kind of this desire from the fan base, and it's natural, to, to want every player that commits to be like this five-star blue-chip kid. Uh, those are great, but I think it's important, like you said, f to have guys that are filling in deficiencies for this UNC program and gaps that they've shown the last year or two years. Uh, and obviously, you know, Jalen Withers does that to a certain extent. Um, last thing before we get out of here, I guess I'll let uh, – Sean, is there anything else you want to add about about Withers' game, things that you've seen maybe that uh, you'd like to see him improve or, or places you feel like he might be able to provide some instant impact uh, maybe that we haven't mentioned so far? I mean, we, we talked about shooting. I, I think, um, you know, moving, moving off the ball is, is definitely something that, that he can, he can do. Um, I think the main thing for him and the main concern is, you know, how long is he going without making an impact? Uh, you don't want him to be relied on just as a catch and shoot three pointer, uh, or three point shooter. He's not Brady Manick uh, and that, that's putting a lot of pressure on him. I think he can, he will be able to hit them, but how is he impacting the game offensively? Uh, his, his offensive rebounding rating was pretty much a zero, um, which, you know, for a, a guy his size is, uh, you know, beg, beg some questions. Is it, is it the system? Uh, obviously, he was playing out on the perimeter a lot, so that that has something to do with it. But I think, um, you know, you, you need somebody that can be aggressive and help Armando on the boards. He had a pretty good percentage as a, as a freshman. Um, so once again, hopefully he's he's aggressive and then, you know, defensively, is he? He hasn't really done much from a block and steal perspective. But can he? Can he lock? Uh, maybe lock, lock down might be a strong. But can he? Can he switch? And is, can he make sure that teams are not targeting him? Um, I, I think that's a big, big thing because we have seen that in the past. So I would say, as long as he's not going long stretches without making an impact, I think it'll be a, a net positive for UNC. And if you can get if you can get the good from the shooting and combine some of those stretches of uh, other play that you've seen from him over the years, I think, you know, you're getting, 
you can get a, a pretty efficient starter. I would say from a, you know, we talked about potential. I think it's always good to, you know, is he an NBA player? Is he a G League player? I think he's an over, I think he's a productive overseas player, um, which I think, once again, you don't need all NBA players. But if you, you know, I think, is he coming off the bench? Probably not. He was probably, probably going to slot into that starting role. So um, I, I think that that fits the bill, but just kind of understanding, you know, hey, he's not going to be dropping 20 and 10, but if he can get you, if he can get 12 and seven, I think that would be an A plus. If he's getting you 10 and 10 and six, I still think that's a, a win. But, you know, if he, if he's going into slumps, I think that's, that that's what will hurt. Cheryl, one of the things I think folks have seen on social media is, you know, is players that are still on the current roster or still a part of the UNC program uh, trying to recruit guys to come fill these open roster spots. I would also say that Johnny T-Shirt probably helps to recruit these guys as well because of simply the large array of UNC gear that you can pick up there. Uh, Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com, we appreciate them supporting this show. Uh, they have been reliable supporters of Inside Carolina and IC's content. We want you to be reliable shoppers there. Johnny T-Shirt.com or right there on East Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. Hit them up. Make sure that you're showing love to them the way they show love to us. Sherelle, how much do current players like R.J. Davis and Armando Baycott have to do in recruitment like this? I mean, obviously, we're seeing the things that they're posting online. I see subscribers are seeing it. And it's obviously been some fodder for, for some long threads. But how much involvement do those guys have? You mentioned that Baycott and Withers played together on Team Loaded before. Uh, how much of that is, is, is true and how much of these guys are talking? Because we know there's no dead period for players to talk to each other. How, how does that look like? Um, I'm going to answer your question. I want to go back to what Sean said, talking about withers and everything and expectations. Um, I, I stole this from someone else, but Isaiah Hicks averaged 11 points and five and a half rebounds as a senior on a national championship team. I'm not comparing Jalen Withers to Isaiah Hicks, but I think the expectation is like, oh, there should be a guy who comes in and scores 18 points a game and has 12 rebounds a game. And I don't think that's realistic. You know, if Withers is able to give you 10 and five, whether he's starting or not, I think you consider that a win, especially if he's shooting a decent clip from three. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, shouts to the person I got it from. I'm sure you're listening. Thank you. Um, as far as the players and how they communicate, uh, like you said, there's there's no dead period. There's no limitations on how many contacts you can have per week or per season. Um, so the players really become I don't want to call them de facto agents, but they become like kind of runners for <laughs> you know the program because uh, they're they're unburdened and unlimited in what they can do. So if there's a player who entered the portal and Armando Baycott really wants to play with him, I'm sure Armando Baycott can DM him or have his number already or uh, has his number already. He can call him and say, hey, man, you know, this is what we're thinking. This is who we think we have. You know, this is what we want to do. Come join us. And, you know, Armando Baycott can, can get the response and he can go back and tell who he needs to tell and that can start the process if need be. Um, so I think everybody's always talking because, you know, you want to be in a good situation. Um, you want to be somewhere that has um, the things that you're looking for. And I think players have earned that trust from each other over the years that if someone says, hey, come play with me, this is a good situation, they'll believe them. Because no one, you know, I, I don't think people who know each other well and have relationships would be like, hey, man, come over here when it's actually awful. They wouldn't do that to each other. Um, but that's how that, that's one of the reasons all this is so connected is because all these kids have played together for so long um, in grassroots and AU and USA basketball, even high school. Um, and some of the the bigger um, academies, they played together for so long. They've maintained these relationships for all these years. And I'm not going to say they're as effective recruiters as the, as the coaches, but um, they definitely are a factor that maybe wasn't there in, in the past, you know, kind of pre-portal. Interesting. I'll just let that sit for a minute. But I'm also reminded of, you know, before I joined the team at IC, you know, Sherelle and I had a lot of back channel discussions. There, there was talking that went on. Uh, I hope I'm not giving away too much there, but uh, people are people, and um, I think uh, it would be safe to assume that what you're seeing players allude to on social media is probably actually taking place in real life as well, just likely that we're not going to hear it verbatim. Uh, boys, let's get out of here. Uh, again, Jalen Withers commits to North Carolina, transfer from Louisville, a six foot eight, 215 215-pound forward. Uh, Sherelle had a great write-up 
already on InsideCarolina.com. If you haven't seen that today, he's actually talked with Withers to get some feedback from him. And there's a really good profile about his commitment that's up. Uh, I'm sure Sean will be getting some more video cut-ups and analysis on down the road. So stay tuned to Inside Carolina for that. And uh, we will be uh, we will be getting on one more thing from Sean before we get out of here. Sean, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just looking at the website, uh, Bart Torvik, which already has uh, some of his ah. projections up. And uh, from an offensive rating perspective, has him at a 102.2 with a 17% usage um, and defensive rebounding percentage going down, probably in large part because of Armando. But uh, those were just a few few stats that that uh, jumped out when I hit uh, refresh on that. So hopefully it's a little higher than, than that, but um, you know, something to start with. Good catch, bro. Appreciate you getting that before we get out of here. All right, boys, thank you for making time in the middle of the day. Again, emergency edition, uh, Inside Carolina's Coast to Coast podcast. As more of these develop, we will be sure to bring you the news as quickly as we are able. And you know, IC is not going to give you any news until it's legit. So uh, stick around. We appreciate everybody listening to the show. Shout out to Johnny T-Shirt for the sponsorship, to John Siegley for producing, to Sherelle McMillan and Sean Moran for bringing the info that they always bring. I'm just Joey Powell, your host. We will talk to you next time on the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. Late.